You're sitting on the balcony, fiddling with your phone, when suddenly, everything around you starts to turn to dust. Gaping, you put your phone down. You see cars, bicycles, sidewalks, street, and traffic lights disappear right in front of your eyes. People in the street are panicking and running in different directions. You glance at your watch, and it vanishes too. You turn to look at your room through the balcony door and see that all your furniture is turning to dust. You look back at the street and see nothing but a dust storm. Your house starts shaking. You run downstairs and stand in the middle of the road. You're just in time to see the buildings in your neighborhood fade away. You try to get into your car, but in the next moment, there's nothing in the place where it was standing just a second ago. You check your phone and see several notifications about the world going on a full reset. Everything humans have ever created is now disappearing. You're still holding your phone when it gets lighter and lighter, until it's completely gone. The same process is happening all around the world. The Eiffel Tower, the Pyramids of Giza, the Empire State Building, they have all vanished. You try to find somewhere to hide until this disaster ends. Two years later, you wake up in a cave, together with other people. Everything humans have produced throughout the centuries of hard work has disappeared from the face of the Earth. Everything that's left behind is people, animals, and nature. Your city is now a massive plain of barren land, with a few trees scattered here and there. Your community consists of your former barber, a comic book store manager, local baker, and your neighbors and friends. You head out of the cave to pick up some crops you planted earlier in the season. There's not a building in sight that would obstruct your view. You can see the mountains miles away. That's where the nearest town used to be. And over there, that's the ocean where you once went jogging by the bay. The land is swarming with wildlife. Plenty of raccoons, badgers, possums, and wild cats roam the neighborhood. Next to your tiny garden, there's a large bonfire where you cook food and have your night gatherings. Not too far away, you can see a well. Once, there was an old piping network down there. But when the world reset, it disappeared. The only thing that remained underground was the water that you now use for drinking. Your local police officer is the leader of the community. He stands on a log and says you've only got a week left before the water runs out completely. You'll need to move to another location with a new source of water. You finish your work and take a quick nap because you're on night duty. You walk around the perimeter. There's no light pollution anymore, and stars are gleaming above your head. Two other people are also patrolling the area. Suddenly, you see something running in the distance. You look closely and spot a fox. It's heading to your chicken coop. You run toward the animal and shoo it off. Finally, it's the moving day. Everyone packs their stuff in bags made of rope and begins walking. You've got only one horse carrying supplies and water for everyone. It's going to take around a week on foot to reach the lakes. You make your way through the plain, which used to be a highway leading to the next state. It's scorching hot, and your group is moving very slowly. Along the way, you meet other nomadic caravans that trade goods with you. At night, you set up camp next to an old gas station. The building is gone, but the foundation is still there. A week later, you finally make it to the mountains near the lake and enter the forest. You have to walk uphill almost all the way. Soon, it gets too dark. You have to make camp under the cover of old trees. It's a cold night, and the members of your group gather around a campfire. You're back to your night duty when everyone falls asleep. You scout the area and hear some growling sounds. You look around and spot a bear. You duck down and try not to make any noise. Suddenly, you notice that next to you, there's a little bear cub. It's curiously sniffing the air just a dozen of feet away from you. The mama bear roars, calling its kid. You back up slowly. Everything is fine until you accidentally step on a branch. The cub starts wailing. Its mom leaps out from behind the trees and spots you. The massive creature stands up on its hind legs and roars.
people in the camp wake up in a panic. You run back with the bear right behind you. The leader and the rest of the night patrol manage to scare the furious animal off. You've got tons of experience with foxes and raccoons, but bears are a whole new thing. You realize that you're not at the top of the food chain anymore. The next day, you proceed with extreme caution. Lots of wild animals, like mountain lions and bobcats, are lurking around. You finally make it to the other side of the mountain and see the lake. It's a large area that used to be a public camping spot. Now, there are a couple of settlements built near the water. Your community isn't that big. That's why you settle near the river flowing out of the lake. You build a hut next to the waterfall and continue to work as a farmer. You meet amazing people from other settlements. They used to be scientists, engineers, musicians, doctors. The scientists are trying to figure out a way to rebuild the society based on technology. But it's likely to take decades. They've made the first step by creating a clay oven, pots, and pans. They've also built a dock on the lake and canoes for fishing and transportation. A couple of months pass. You've constructed an irrigation system that uses lake water. The engineers in the settlement have even made a piping system. It delivers fresh water to every house. Now, these specialists are constructing a small dam to generate electricity, but that might take months to do. The settlement is growing bigger with each next week. New huts are being built all the time. A carpenter has created a workshop to make furniture and tools. You no longer have to be on night duty and can focus entirely on your crops. Ever since everything humans had created vanished, people have been much healthier and stronger than before. No one sits in their hut with their eyes on the phone or TV screen. The smog that used to cover cities has disappeared. Marine life is thriving. There's no pollution. And trees are now growing in places that were once deforested. Everyone travels on foot or by horses and donkeys. People have been breeding these animals for transportation so there are plenty of them around. And the economy has changed, with everyone offering their labor in return for food or other things they need. All people have to contribute if they want to live in settlements. There are some nomads who stay alone, but it's not easy to survive in the wild without help. That's why these people mainly work as merchants. They deliver goods between settlements that are too far away from one another. To entertain themselves, People role-play parts of old classic movies in front of an audience. Someone managed to make guitars, flutes, and percussion instruments from scratch. Now, you can listen to concerts at night. You find a beautiful spot to do some drawing. You use natural ink and leaves instead of paper. Suddenly, you spot something sticking out of the ground. You pick it up and examine the familiar, almost perfect shape. In a moment, you're already rushing back to your hut to wash off the dirt. Someone tries to check what you're doing, but you make sure no one sees your find. Finally, it's clean. Your suspicion is confirmed. It's a smartphone. It's the first evidence of the past technological progress which hasn't disappeared. You try to get it to work, and the gadget actually does turn on. You read a text on the phone, and it reveals the truth behind everything created by people turning to dust. Every April, a group of scientists observes the faint glow of asteroids passing by our planet. One year, they realized there was something weird shimmering in their telescopes. The team expected it to be another asteroid. But they ended up very surprised, because what they discovered was an unusual space rock that didn't consist of the minerals that usually make up asteroids. It was made of silicate, the material mostly found on the moon. They named it Kamo Oaliwa, which is a Hawaiian word that means wobbling celestial object. The rock didn't match any near-Earth asteroids scientists had already been familiar with. Instead, that piece had a pattern of reflected light similar to that of the moon rocks astronauts had brought back from NASA missions. This fragment turned out to be a quasi-satellite, which is a kind of asteroids that orbit both our planet and the Sun. It repeatedly circles Earth and has a quite unusual tilt. That's the reason you can only see it in the night sky once a year. The fragment is pretty shy, too. Aww. It never gets closer to our planet than 9 million miles. That's almost 40 times as far away as the Moon. Plus, this space body often hides in the shadows. 
scientists have figured out the piece won't stay in this orbit for a long time. It probably arrived at its current position about 500 years ago, and its orbit is likely to change in the next 300 years. This fragment may not be alone out there in space. Mm -mm. There are at least three more similar near-Earth objects. They may have all come from the same place. Researchers aren't sure yet about the nature of the rock, but they can find out more about this unusual space object if they send a spacecraft to collect samples and bring them to Earth. That's something China's space agency is planning to do later this decade. Now, the moon appeared in the middle of chaos. There are several theories about how that happened. The first one claims the moon used to be just a wandering body, similar to an asteroid. It formed somewhere in our solar system. Once, it approached too close to Earth and got captured by our planet's gravity. The second theory says that our planet was spinning so quickly that some material broke off and started circling around it. One of the largest pieces was the moon. The third theory says that the moon was formed at a time when our planet was going through its own formation process. But today, the most widely accepted theory goes like this. Once, a long, long time ago, but not in a galaxy far, far away. Earth collided with a Mars-sized planet. The debris and clouds of dust from the collision gathered around our planet and started circling it. Eventually, something that we today know as the moon formed there. Apollo missions brought more than a third of a ton of soil and rock from the lunar surface. These rocks show that the moon had mostly the same building materials as our planet. This might mean they have a common history. If the moon had been formed somewhere else and had been eventually captured by the gravitational force of our planet, it would have a different composition. Also, if it had been created at the same time as our planet or had once broken off, there would be the same minerals on both the moon and Earth. But the minerals on the moon contain less water. Plus, our planet's natural satellite is rich in materials that form fast at high temperatures. Now, the moon isn't the only space body in the solar system with a mysterious past. Hippocamp is Neptune's moon, discovered in 2013. It's the smallest moon of this ice giant, a mere 21 miles across. It's very close to Proteus, the biggest of Neptune's inner moons. And no, Hippocamp is not a place for big African mammals to spend the summer. Scientists think Hippocamp probably formed from debris after Proteus collided with a comet. If Hippocamp had entered Proteus's orbit from some other place in our solar system, the bigger moon would have either swallowed it or booted the tiny moon away. But not even Proteus itself is among the first generation of Neptune's moons. It was formed from the remains of the planet's earliest system of moons. Those first moons were destroyed when Neptune captured Triton, currently the largest of its moons. The main evidence proving the collision was likely to happen is the fact that Triton circles around Neptune backward, unlike other moons orbiting the planet. Neptune captured Triton from the Kuiper Belt. That's an area filled with icy objects and rocky debris stretching beyond Uranus. That means Hippocamp is a third-generation moon, kind of like a second cousin twice removed or something. Now the Sun also had a turbulent past. Our star appeared about 4.6 billion years ago. It's hard to study its early stages of life since that happened 50 million years before our planet was even formed. But recently, a team of researchers has discovered crystals that are over 4.5 billion years old. Hidden deep within meteorites, they've revealed some things about the past of our Sun. Before the planets were formed, our solar system had consisted of a central star and a massive disk of dust and hot gas spiraling around it. As the dust and gases cooled down, they turned into minerals, including the crystals found in the meteorites that landed on our planet. Those ancient materials were irradiated, unlike some younger substances. Researchers think something might have happened to the Sun after those crystals were formed. Perhaps the activity of our star was less intense then. Or maybe, for some reason, these younger materials couldn't travel to the areas where irradiation was possible. Dwarf planets give us a chance to sneak a peek into the ancient years of the solar system. Around 4 billion years ago, Jupiter's, Saturn's, and Neptune's gravitational forces joined. They sent asteroids and comets hurtling across the solar system, making them collide with different planets. All the dwarf planets from the Kuiper Belt, for example Pluto, Eris, Haumea, Makemake, have their own moons that likely formed after some powerful collisions. Icy debris in orbits similar to Haumea's, for example, can prove the theory of an ancient collision. 
the debris it created simply didn't have enough energy to float away from the dwarf planet's gravitational pull. Ceres, another dwarf planet, has ammonia-rich clays on its surface. Ammonia isn't stable at the temperatures prevailing on Ceres. But there's plenty of this substance in the outer solar system. It means that Ceres was probably formed in those outer parts and got kicked inward. After all, the gas giants were migrating a lot at those early stages of the solar system. Or the dwarf planet could have formed in an asteroid belt, and ammonia somehow, let's say after a powerful impact, appeared on the dwarf planet. Ceres might help scientists understand icy moons better. The ocean floor on Earth has a high concentration of carbonate minerals, and some parts of Ceres have them too. This means this dwarf planet is like some sort of fossilized ocean world. Many exoplanets, a term used for planets outside the solar system, have also gone through pretty intense collisions in their early stages. This double star system is more than 300 light years away from us, and its stars are at least 1 billion years old. Even though it's not young, this system still shows some signs of swirling clouds of dusty debris that haven't cooled down yet, which isn't something you'd expect from a star system of this age. This debris is still warm. It means there might have been a strong collision of two planets or some other space bodies of similar size in that region and relatively recently. So hey, everybody just simmer down. Dust particles circle around a young star. They stick together and grow bigger with time. That's how planets form. The leftover dust often settles in some distant cold areas. An example in our solar system is the Kuiper Belt. It's located far away beyond Neptune. As solar systems evolve, those particles keep colliding until they're so small they end up being pulled into nearby stars or kicked out of the system. Uranus spins on its side if you compare it with the rest of the planets in our solar system. And the only way we can explain it is a powerful collision in the past. Something much bigger than a regular comet or some other space body of similar size likely hit Uranus and knocked the planet on the side. It was probably a planet twice the size of Earth. It could be a protoplanet. This is a space body made up mostly of ice and rock that orbits a star and is likely to develop into a planet sometime in the future. Anyway, the fallout from the impact smothered the core of Uranus. It prevented the heat inside the planet from escaping. This might explain why Uranus has extremely cold temperatures on its surface. <laughs> Man, bring a jacket and a blanket! So get this, the Earth acquires 40,000 tons of mass every single year. More and more people are being born, new buildings and structures. You might think that's something that adds mass, but nope. Since it's created out of existing matter on the Earth, it's actually dust falling from space to our planet. That dust consists of vestiges coming from our solar system, like space bodies that never managed to form into a planet, or asteroids and meteors that fell apart on their way and now drifting around. Our planet is there like a giant vacuum cleaner that pulls in all those particles of dust powered by gravity. So yes, Earth gains weight. But some calculations also say the entire planet, including the atmosphere and the sea, is losing around 50,000 metric tons of its mass annually. Gases like hydrogen and helium are within our planet's atmosphere, but they're so light gravity can't retain them there. So huge amounts of those gases escape our planet every year. 6 pounds of hydrogen every second. Sounds like a lot, but the Earth is really heavy, so it would take trillions of years for all the hydrogen to escape our atmosphere. Also, the planet's core is like some sort of big nuclear reactor. It runs all the time, so it gradually loses energy, which means it's losing mass too. Our planet is not a perfectly shaped sphere. It's more like a squashed one. As it spins, gravity is directed toward the Earth's center, while a centrifugal force goes outward. Earth has a tilted axis, so centrifugal force doesn't exactly oppose gravity. Also, gravity pushes those extra masses of Earth and water up at the equator into a bulge. Earth also has a waistline, 24,900 miles. You weigh more standing at one of the poles than at the equator. Although, for weight loss, Pluto comes as the best option. A 150-pound person would weigh around 10 pounds there. Avoid Jupiter, the same person would weigh over 350 pounds there. Our planet is all green and blue now, but chances are it used to be purple. 
Scientists think ancient microbes might have used some other molecule to harness the sunlight instead of chlorophyll that gives plants their green color. That molecule possibly colored the living organisms into a more violet shade. The Earth is electric. Just one stroke of lightning can heat the air to over 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which causes the air to rapidly expand. That same ballooning air makes a shock wave we know as thunder. 6,000 lightning flashes appear all over the planet every minute, and the longest one occurred in the sky above Brazil, 440 miles long. Newer studies found out that the Earth's core is as hot as the sun's surface, over 9,300 degrees. The driest spot we have is the Atacama Desert of Peru and Chile. The center of Atacama has spots where we've never recorded any rain. The coldest place is naturally Antarctica, where winter temperatures can go down to minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm, no thanks. It's also the biggest desert we have on Earth. We imagine deserts as endless, sandy, and insanely hot areas. But there are coastal, subtropical, and polar deserts. They all have windswept and barren lands, which makes them very difficult for animals and plants to inhabit. The Pacific Ocean is the Earth's biggest ocean basin, which covers a huge area of almost 80 million square miles. The Pacific contains over half of the free water on our planet, and is so big, all of our continents could fit there. Earth used to have two moons, or at least that's something scientists believe. That second one was almost three times smaller than the one we have today, and may have orbited our planet before it slammed into the bigger one. This clash may be an explanation of why the two sides of the moon we're left with is not equal. And there are moonquakes going on. It looks pretty inactive from our perspective, but the ground there is definitely shaking, although less than on Earth. Moonquakes shake at great depths, especially midway between the lunar center and its surface. To get to the longest mountain chain, we have to look way down under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. It's a chain of volcanoes that goes about 18,000 feet above the bottom and spans over 40,000 miles. We have a magnificent planet, more than 4.5 billion years old, which makes it 10,000 times older than humans. But it's not the same as it was in the beginning. The ground we walk on is recycled. Earth has its cycle. Magma from the depths of our planet comes up and hardens into rocky matter. Tectonic movements brings the rock to the surface where erosion happens. That's a process where wind, water, and other natural forces break apart rock and changes it. The small pieces get buried, deposited, and compacted into sedimentary rocks, like sandstone. If these rocks are buried deep enough, they get cooked and transformed into magma. So the whole cycle repeats all over again. We got used to seeing lava and ash coming out of volcanoes but some of them even produce their own flashes of lightning. In 2020, the Tal Volcano, which is around 40 miles away from the Philippines' capital, Manila, started blasting smoke and ash pretty high into the air. Inside its ash column, small pieces were colliding and then producing lightning flashes people could see scattering across the sky. Lakes can go crazy and explode too. Neos, Manun, and Kivu are three lakes that sit above volcanoes. Since there's magma under their surface, there's carbon dioxide released into the lakes, which leads to a deep gas layer above the lake bed. It's pretty rare, but carbon dioxide can suddenly erupt from the lake and form an unpleasant gas cloud, similar to something a volcano does. 70% of our planet's surface is covered in oceans, but we've only explored 5% of them. And around 300 million years ago, I wasn't around then, we only had one massive supercontinent called Pangaea, with one huge sea, Panthalassa. Surprisingly, coral reefs are the biggest living structures. They consist of small coral polyps, but together they make a true community of organisms and a very important part of Earth's ecosystem. Some coral structures can even be seen from space. The Earth's surface is not evenly shaped, which means mass is uneven too. That way, gravity is not the same in all spots on Earth. There's a mysterious anomaly in the Hudson Bay of Canada. The gravity there is lower than in other regions surrounding this area, and scientists believe it's because of melted glaciers. During the last ice age, that region was covered in ice, which is now long gone and melted. But the planet hasn't completely recovered from the icy burden. Gravity over any area is proportional to its mass. 
The glacier left an imprint that pushed aside a part of the planet's mass, which is one of the reasons why the gravity is weaker in that area. Some bugs get nastier when in space, without gravity. Studies showed some bacteria, like Salmonella, can make worse damage in space because there's something in the lack of gravity that makes them tougher and changes their activity. The days on Earth are slowly getting longer. When the planet was formed, days were about 6 hours long and gradually got longer. 620 million years ago, a day lasted 22 hours. Today, we have 24 hours, but it's increasing by around 1.7 milliseconds every century. This happens because of the moon. It's slowing down our planet's rotation with the tides it helps create. When the Earth is spinning, tidal ocean bulges are pulled a little bit ahead of the moon-Earth axis. That makes some sort of force that slows down the rotation of our planet, which is how our days are getting longer, but really slowly. We'll have to stick to our 24-hour schedule for a very, very long time. Earth's core certainly seems to be far away from us, but the distance is not that big – 1,800 miles. That's shorter than Route 66. The strongest earthquake we ever had was in Chile, a magnitude 9.5. If an earthquake ever reached magnitude 12, it could split our planet in half. Also, if there's an earthquake happening, it can hit more than 400 miles under the surface, which is why people on the other side of the planet can literally feel that. Our planet has around 100 million times more individual viruses than there are stars in the universe. Clouds are not some fluffy things whose shapes we sometimes like to watch. They actually help regulate the temperature of Earth. If we could pull out all water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, that would cover the planet with a liquid film as thick as a human hair. And yet, such a small amount of water brings enough differences with the weather and climate our planet would be 13 degrees hotter if it weren't for clouds.